thank you so much for introdu introduction introducing me and i would like to thank uh dr lee and sam for having me here it's a big honor for me to be a big be a part of this uh, the great team can you see the full screen you can you yeah. see the full screen right yes, yeah, we, can. we can all right okay thank you yes, so much okay. okay so um i would like to talk about actually previous uh previous speakers like dr matthias suhdeep and abida uh gave spectacular talks that makes my talks easier my job easier here to talk so I would like to talk about uh, the different perspective entry zones and also um, like surgical approach briefly in 25 minutes. So the, we already uploaded my slides to the Rotten Collection. You can create a free account to get the slides and the, you can download them and also, you know, the study for your uh, another, um, the, the presentations. The sum of the slide also can be found in this book, The Color Atlas of Brainstem Surgery. So uh, the previous speakers already covered everything. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about it. Now we are looking at the skull from above. So, and as we know, of, this is front and this is the back. This is the skull base. And as we know, of, there's a three fossa anterior and middle fossa. And the, the border between the middle and the posterior fossa is the petros bone, petros ridge here. And we see the clivus in the midline. Here's a petroclival junction. The brainstem and cerebellum sit in the posterior fossa. So ventral located lesions, brainstem lesions, we can come from anterior through the anterior fossa, even through the nose, like here. Either, or we can come from lateral through the middle fossa, or we can come from posterior fossa to reach the ventral located lesions in the brainstem. For dorsal located lesions, we can we use the posterior trajectories to reach the tumor and the lesions, as my formation, et cetera. So, um, I want to talk about here again. So this is the petrosal ridge, and the sinus superior to the petrosal ridge is a superior petrosal sinus, runs superior to the petrosal ridge, and the sinus inferior to the petros bone, inferior petrosal sinus, runs the petroclival junction here. So those are important the structures that we will see. Here we see the cranial nerves. You know, one, two, three, four. This is the four, which is a thinus cranial nerve. And the only nerve arises from the dorsal part surface of the brain stem. The five is thickest nerve. And all the way down, we see the seven and eight. And the lower cranial nerve is nine, only one rootlet, 10 multiple rootlets. And we see the 11. And a little bit lower place, we, we, we could see hypoglossal in the 12th cranial nerve. So the brain stem has a three parts already mentioned, midbrain, pons, and medulla, and the cerebellum covers the brain stem dorsally here. The posterior circulation uh, supplies the brain stem and cerebellum. Here we see both vertebral arteries come together to form the basilar artery, most commonly at the level of the pontomedullar sulcus here. The vertebral artery gives off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica, anterior spinal artery. The basal artery gives off the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, ica, and the superior cerebellar artery is going to be here. Let's go. The rule of three from Dr. Rotan. So we have three parent basals arteries. We have three parts of the brain stem and we have three surfaces of the cerebellum. The cerebellum has tentorial surface, which faces the tentorium, and suboccipital surface, which faces the occipital bone, and the petrosal surface, which faces the petros bone. Brain stem, midbrain, pons, medulla. The pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, 
supplies the medulla and suboccipital surface of the cerebellum. And ICA supplies the pons and petrosal surface of the cerebellum, while the superior cerebellar artery supplies the midbrain and the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. When we look at internal structures of the brainstem, here we see the medial lemmiscus. As we talk about it, this is the most tolerant fiber tract for surgical uh, manipulations. And the medial lemmiscus uh, runs all the way down the brainstem and split it, divide it, divide the brainstem into ventral and the dorsal parts. Of course, there are different kinds of classifications too, but you know, this is, can be used, at least I'm using this. So in other words, the ventral to the mid medial lemmiscus in the midbrain, it's called the ventral midbrain. Dorsal to the medial lemmiscus in the midbrain is the dorsal midbrain. The same thing, ventral to the medial lemmiscus in the pons, the ventral pons, dorsal is a dorsal pons. Middle way is the same. So the neurocritical structure in the ventral brain stem is the corticospinal tract. And the dorsal brain stem, we see the medial longitudinal fasciculus, MLF. And other uh, important structures, MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, and the central tegmental tract, trigeminal, mesencephalic, and the spinal tracts are neurocritical structures in the dorsal brain stem. So now we are looking at the floor of the fourth ventricle. The one side still intact, and this side just removed the eponema. Here we see the trigeminal nerve, gives off the trigeminal spinal tract, which descends to the spine. And this is a trigeminal mesencephalic tract, ascends up to the uh, midbrain. We see the MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, just next to the midline. And the last, the fiber tract is a central tegmental tract, is a part of extrapyramidal system, and also con interconnect the olive and the red nucleus here. So here's a facial colliculus, abducens nucleus, and the facial fibers. So let's uh, move on to the midbrain. Midbrain is the top of the brain stem. And the key structures for the midbrain is the oculomotor nerve and aqueduct. So ventral midbrain, here we see oculomotor nerve, mammary body, the entry zones, we have, we can enter lateral to the oculomotor nerve or medial to the oculomotor nerve. Those are uh, cerebral peduncles, and here's the interpedicular fossa, the both cerebral peduncles here and this is interpedicular fossa. The lateral to the oculomotor nerve can be used as an entry zone, or we can use, uh, we can enter to the brain stem through the interpedicular fossa, which is called interpedicular fossa approach. Now we are looking, front, looking at uh, from front and front. Here we see the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve runs most likely between the superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Sometimes, very rare, like three to 5%, the SCA superior cerebellar artery can arise from the posterior cerebral artery. So then we see the oculomotor nerve underneath is underneath to both arteries. But usually most likely, uh, most commonly, we see the oculomotor nerve running between these two uh, arteries. So anti zone is the periocular zone, lateral to the oculomotor nerve, and the medially, medial to the oculomotor nerve is the interpedicular fossa anti zone. So here we see again that the oculomotor nerve is the key. When we follow the oculomotor nerve all the way back, we can reach the midbrain, the, depending on the location of the lesion, we can either open lateral to the oculomotor nerve, or we can open the medial to the oculomotor nerve. Here's the interpenicular fossa. And especially, you know, like lateral located lesions, let's say in the left side, this is Dr. Spessler's technique. And when, when you come from the contralateral side, that provides straightforward and the direct shot for the lesions following the oculomotor nerve medially. If you want to open the periocular motor antizone or lateral to the oculomotor nerve, we can follow the oculomotor nerve 
laterally to reach the midbrain. Here is the, we are on the left side, and this is ipsilateral oculomotor nerve, and here's a contralateral oculomotor nerve. When we follow the oculomotor nerve, here's the interpendicular fossa. Of course, there are some perforators here that we want to preserve. And we can just, you know, the, make an incision, the, the remove the lesions in this part. This is a target area. We are still talking about the ventral surface of the midbrain. So what kind of surgical approach we can use? We can come through the anterior fossa. We can use a terional approach, orbitozygomatic approach, modified orbitozygomatic approach. And also we can use the uh, supraorbital eyebrow approach. Here is the, an example of the modified OZ approach. The removal of the orbital roof provides the greater exposure to the ventral midbrain. Here we see, and this is the ICA optic nerve. We see the ocular motor nerve and we follow the ocular motor nerve all the way down. We can reach the midbrain. This is the perioocular motor entry zone, which is lateral to the ocular motor nerve. Uh, if you want to open the interpenicular fossa, usually the road between the optical cord, uh, uh, the, the triangle can be used. Also, we see the SCA, superior cerebral artery, and the posterior cerebral artery here. The ocular motor nerve runs between these arteries. Another option, using the mini-modified OZ, which is actually the same craniotomy with the supraorbital eyebrow, uh, eyebrow approach. Only incision is a different. We just do the incision like similar to the terrional approach and removal of the orbital roof here. And this is the frontal dura. And proceeding under the frontal lobe. And the similar, this is a supraorbital eyebrow incision. The medial border is going to be supraorbital nerve here. After craniotomy, we just you know, proceed uh, this space between the frontal, uh, the lobe and the orbital roof. This is an endoscopic view. We see the ipsilateral optic nerve, contralateral optic nerve, ipsilateral ICA, intercarotid artery, anterior cerebral artery, Hertner's artery. Now I'm looking for the ocular motor nerve to get the midbrain. Here's the ocular motor nerve here. And following all the way down, I can reach the midbrain and the ventral surface of the midbrain. For lateral midbrain, as already mentioned, this is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus that can be used as an entry zone. The lateral mesencephalic sulcus corresponds to the most lateral edge of the medial lemniscus. If you remember, ventral or anterior to the medial lemniscus is the ventral midbrain and dorsal or posterior to the medial lemniscus is going to be dorsal midbrain. So in the ventral midbrain, the most uh, critical structure is the corticospinal tract. And the dorsal midbrain, we see the red nucleus, ocular motor, and trochlear nuclei, that, uh, um, the which sits in, just in front of the aqueduct here. So ocular motor and trochlear nuclei are located just in front of the aqueduct, which is another, uh, the, the landmark and important structures for the midbrain. Also, as we said, this is the dorsal midbrain, just behind the medial lemniscus. The dorsal midbrain is subdivided into tegmentum and tectum. From the medial lemniscus to the aqueduct, here's a tegmentum. Behind the aqueduct, here we see the tectum part of the midbrain. Let's see, this is, the, this is an axial section. We see the both ocular motor nerves and here's the interpendicular fossa. This is the medial lemniscus or substantia nigra here. The substantia nigra is located just ventral surface of the medial lemniscus. Can be considered also as you know, the, the border for the ventral and the dorsal midbrain. In front of the medial lemniscus or substantia nigra is the ventral midbrain, cruz cerebri, and the Behind of the medial lemniscus is a dorsal midbrain. Dorsal midbrain is subdivided into tegmentum from the medial lemniscus to the aqueduct at the level of the aqueduct. And behind the aqueduct is going to be tectum. tectum. 
is important. It is important because uh, the if the lesion is located tegmentum, we are using a different surgical approach. If you know for the lesions located in the tectum, we use a different surgical approaches. The neurocritical structures in the tegmental area is a red nucleus, and this is the oculomotor fibers and oculomotor nuclei, which is uh, located just in front of the aqueduct. Here is the our entry zone, which is lateral mesencephalic sulcus. We can access to the ventral and the dorsal, most, most commonly for the tegmental area. And this is the target area, lateral surface of the midbrain. We can come either supratentorially. This is a zygoma, and this is subtemporal craniotomy. We are about a tentorium, but this is surgical view, and this is a, a tentorium again. This is a temporal lobe. What we see here is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, lateral mesencephalic vein, runs just around to the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, and here we see the trochlear nerve. So another option, we can come infratentorially uh, trajectory. So this is lateral supracerebellar infratentorial, as we saw of, uh, Dr. Guelli's surgery and Abida mentioned about it. Here's a transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus here. So here's a tentorium again. We are infratentorial area. Here we see the pineal gland posteriorly, and this is lateral mesencephalic vein, and here is the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. For dorsal midbrain, we see the colliculi. The eye is superior to the ear, so superior colliculi is related with the vision, and inferior colliculi are related with the auditory, the sound. So we see the supra and infra colliculi, and the antizone is the antizone. We can make an incision superior to the superior colliculi between the pineal gland and the superior colliculi. Another antizone can be used between the frenulum valley and the trochlear nerve and the inferior colliculi here. Or another option is using the intercollicular area. The important part again, so we don't want to, we don't want to uh, the pass beyond to the aqueduct in the midline because the ocular motor and trochlear nuclei are located just sits just in front of the aqueduct in the midline. Here we see aqueduct again, trochlear ocular motor uh, nuclei. This is the ocular motor nerve, and this is the uh, the fiber tracks uh, of the ocular motor nerve. Red nucleus, another important, the neurocritical structures. Uh, injury of the red nucleus uh, can cause intention tremor or the nystagmus, which is a part of extrapyramidal system. So when we come from uh, posterior, we see the pineal gland is here, vein of gallon. Here's a superior colliculus, colliculi and inferior colliculi. Here's the trochlear nerve again. This is a target area. We can come either from supratentorial or infratentorial uh, space. Here we see the transverse sinuses, and here's a tentorium. This is occipital uh, interhemisphere interhemispheric approach. Here we see the, the vein of gallon. This is the splenium. When we retract the uh, for occipital interhemispheric approach, sometimes the massive bleeding can start. So it's, you know, we usually want to check the internal occipital vein. Because when we retract the occipital lobe, that vein can, you know, the uh, stop uh, can just start the bleeding. So we want to always, you know, the, be sure the internal occipital vein is intact when we uh, get some mass, ma massive bleeding. Also, we can cut the tentorium just next to the midline, the straight sinus, for greater exposure. We see the pineal gland is here, and this is superior colliculi. Another option. We can come uh, supracerebellar if tentorial or transtentorial. There's a three options. There are three options, which is median, uh, supracerebellar if tentorial, paramedian supracerebellar if tentorial, or lateral uh, supracerebellar if tentorial approach. I'm going to show the paramedian. The incision is made the midpoint of the distance from the inion to the asterion. 
superior temporal line we saw, and this is the vein of gallon. And here's kind of uh, after exposure, we see the superior inferior colliculi. For the palms, Here again, this is the medial lemniscus. In front of the medial lemniscus is going to be ventral pons. Behind is the dorsal pons. Now, we are looking from front. This is the ventral surface of the medial lemniscus here. So we are in the ventral pons right now, and we see the corticospinal tract. Key structures for the pons, the trigeminal nerve and the facial colliculus. For the ventral pons, here we see the transverse pontine fibers. To come together to form the middle cerebellar pedicle, the same fiber tracks, at the level of the trigeminal nerve. Lateral to the level of the trigeminal nerve, these transverse pontine fibers are called as the middle cerebellar pedicle. Uh, the trigeminal nerve is the key for the entry zones for ventral located lesions, pontine lesions. We can open, we can uh, use, the, uh, we can entry to the pons above the trigeminal nerve, super trigeminal entry zone, or we can make an incision here between the five and seven cranial nerves, which is called peritrigeminal, or another option, we can make an incision uh, through the middle cerebellar pedicle behind the trigeminal nerve. Of course, the workhorse is a retro sigmoid approach to reach the ventral surface of the palms. Here is the uh, transverse and the sigmoid sinuses. Here we see the seven and eight, the trigeminal nerve. We can even expose the lower cranial nerves. The one root that is the nine, multiple root that are the 10. Also the petrosal surface of the cerebellum can be open. It's kind of like a cilium fissure in the cerebellum that uh, the decrease the need of cerebellar retraction and also gives more exposure here we see the five nerve, seven and eight complex, and this is the medial, middle cerebellar pedicle here. This is peritrigeminal between the five and seven, and here's a supra trigeminal anti zones. So here we see this. This is green. Uh, the the arrow is after opening the petrosal fissure, which is uh, required less cerebellar retraction. Then we can reach the middle cerebellar pedicle, also, also me, uh, central located lesions in the pons with less cerebellar attraction. So how can we get this area? Another option, first option was retrosigmator approach. We can also come subtemporal, transtentorial. The tentorium is cut behind the level where the trochlear nerve enters to the tentorium. Here, what we see here, that this is a trigeminal nerve. Again, supra trigeminal, trigeminal, or middle cerebral pinnacle can be exposed with subtemporal transtemporal uh, transtemporal approach. Another option is the Kavase approach, anterior petrosectomy. Dr. Lees will probably mention about it. This is the greater petrosal nerve. Here we see the arcuate eminence. This is the petrous apex. After drilling to Petro's apex, here we see the trigeminal nerve again. This is the facial nerve. And we, you know, uh, all this, uh, the safe entry zones is under our, our uh, exposure. For the dor dorsal pons, already the uh, surface anatomy is mentioned beautifully. And this is the median sulcus. And here's the medullary part again. This is the hypoglossal vagal trigons, and this is the area post -trima. That is, looks like the pen rib shape in the middle part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So another sulcus is a sulcus limitans. Sulcus limitans, uh, lateral sulcus, and deepens to a point which is lateral to the facial colliculus. And the, another one, which is called superior fovea, superior fovea, and another point, it deepens to just next to the hypoglossal triangle, which is inferior fovea. Superior fovea also can be used for removal of the lesions at the level of the facial colliculus. Here we see the facial uh, colliculus. Closer look. The facial colliculus is formed by the abducens nucleus and the facial fibers. 
And this is the obduscence, uh, the fibers arise from the obduscence nucleus. This is the lateral wheel. Again, obduscence uh, nucleus. This is the facial fibers in the pons. And here is the facial nucleus. The fibers turns around the obduscence nucleus and then exit the brainstem here. So the question is, uh, the obduscence nucleus, the fibers, runs at the level of the uh, pontomedullary sulcus, as already uh, the mention, was mentioned about it. So here is the obduscence nucleus again. This is here, and this is the obduscence nucleus outside of the brainstem. This is important, and the pontomedullary sulcus also another entry zone uh, described by Dr. Lawton. So, but we want to be aware of the obtuseness nucleus. And also there is a two different illustrations in the literature about the position of the obtuseness fibers to the corticospinal tract. The first one is obtuseness fibers passes lateral to the corticospinal tract. The another one indicates the obtuseness fibers passes medial to the corticospinal tract. So which one is correct? This one is correct. Uh, the corticospinal, the, the fibers just, you know, the passes lateral to the corticospinal tract. And here's the staining. Uh, Dr. Matthias also shows a beautiful stain, uh, the dissection pictures. This is the abducens nucleus, lateral to the corticospinal tract. The same is here. For the dorsal pons, here is the facial colliculus, and this is a superficial uh, triangle is bordered by the frenulum valley or trochlear nerve above, inferiorly uh, facial colliculus, medially MLF, and laterally sulcus limitans. Because we want to preserve the STT2, there are some case reports uh, after you know of the uh, after opening the superficial uh, entry. There are some the case reports about the intention tremor and also nystagmus that probably uh, the caused by the injury of the central tegmental tract. And here's corresponds to sulcus limitans here. So anatomically, we want to open between the MLF sulcus limitans. There's a prominence here you can see in the cadavers or you know the, the patient. Superiorly, frenulum valley, which is containing the trochlear nerve, inferiorly facial colliculus. For infrafacial, this is the facial colliculus again, infrafacial approach. The height is superior and inferior border of this triangle is the upper attachment, upper edge, and the lower edge of the telechoroidea, which is roughly corresponds. And inferiorly, the hypoglossal triangle, but if you keep above to the lower edge of the telechoroidea, you are going to preserve the hypoglossal triangle. And if you keep below to the upper edge of the telechoroidea, this is the lateral recess, you can also just uh, uh, avoid to facial colliculus too. Medially, of course, MLF. And laterally also, here is the most medial edge of the attachment of the telechoroidea here. So the telechoroidea and the lateral recess is very important landmark for the infrafacial approach. Here we see attachment of the telechoroidea, upper edge of, the, here's the lateral recess by the way, and here is roughly corresponds to the borders, superior inferior border of the infrafacial. The target area is here. So we can use the tele, the televolar approach to reach the floor of the fourth ventricle. That prominence is the facial colliculus. And the last, the, uh, the middle I want to talk about. So we use, uh, it's already mentioned. So, and this is the olive, and here's the anterior lateral sulcus in front of the olive or pure olivary sulcus. The, the anterior point between the hypoglossal at uh, the nerve and the C1 root beds. We can also use the postalivary sulcus just behind the olive, between the olive and the hypoglossal root beds. 
or for the dorsal located lesions, we can use the dorsal medullary sulci. Of course, the key structure is olive. This is a target area. We use a far lateral approach. The vertebral artery is here. C1 posterior arc can be also removed. Here's the after craniotomy, and this is post olivaris sulcus as an entry zone. Here's a pillar, pure olivaris sulcus. The finally, we see the dorsal medulla. Here's the posterior median sulcus, posterior intermediate sulcus, and also posterior lateral sulcus can be used uh, as an entry zones. And also the last one is the inferior cerebral, cerebellar pedicle can be used to remove the tumor. So the briefly recap is the midbrain for the midbrain, the neurocritical structures is the oculomotor nerve and aqueduct cerebri. For the pons, trigeminal nerve and the facial colliculus. For the medulla is the olive are the key structures. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was an absolutely excellent talk. I'll just ask my, I can't see any questions here, but I'll ask the other panelists if they have any questions. Otherwise, I'll ask a question. Any comments from any of our panelists? While we're waiting, I'll just ask a question. So we were just discussing image guidance after Abida's talk, uh, but what are you, and you, both you and Abida, I think, showed uh, at least you're planning and fiber track mapping on image guidance, I think. Uh, what are your thoughts? And certainly I use it for planning. What are your thoughts on, on fiber track mapping and on image guidance for planning surgery? And how useful is it to first have a really good understanding in the lab and fiber 